hope you enjoy your evening, but uh, most of all, I really would like to thank Marek because um, he, he's, he's pioneered this, uh, this, this area of, of study and it's going to be fascinating to hear how he did it and what he came up with. So I'd like to give a really warm welcome to Marek Kutzinski. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, I've got the bill as the guy who, who delays you hearing Eliza Carthy and delays you eating. <laughs> Good one. But hopefully I've got something interesting to say. Uh, the title of my talk today is I Hear the British Isles Singing. Hmm. And this uh, tells part of the story in our book, which I've done with colleagues Mike Pickering and Emma Robertson, which is coming out with Cambridge University Press next year, called uh, Rhythms of Labour. So in this talk, I Hear the Br uh, British Isles Singing, I'm going to concentrate on mainly on the pre-industrial singing at work cultures in Britain. I'm going to tell their story as much as I can with a railway inflection. <laughs> so the, uh, the title of the, uh, the story, the, the talk, takes, uh, takes its point of departure from a poem by Walt Whitman, I Hear America Singing, one of, yeah. a famous uh, poem by Walt Whitman, in which he recounts hearing the voices of American workers singing as they labour, and he goes through many trades, and, and describes the songs that he's singing. And if we think of America, we know we think we know quite a lot about American singing at work cultures. We know from Walt Whitman's poem. We know from from, from slave songs that they, 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 they were quite well recorded, and, and uh, penitentiary songs, prison songs recorded by Alan Novak. So we know plenty about America singing. We can say I can I hear America singing when we think of a pre-industrial. But if we ask that, uh, that question of ourselves in Britain, can we hear the British Isles singing? Well, actually, we don't know enough to answer that question before we start this, this research project. In the popular imagination, we know about shanties, the singing of, of sailors as they labour and, and pull the sails up and put the, put the anchor down. But apart from shanties, pretty much you would draw a blank from most people if they, if they know about uh, uh, knowledge of, of British cultures of singing at work. So we set ourselves the task of actually, could we hear the British Isles singing? Could we? And first of all, if you go to uh, some uh, the major literary figures that were writing in pre industrial times Shakespeare, Wordsworth we hear, actually, if you look quite closely, quite a lot of references to music at work. And D. H. Even up to D.H. Lawrence, writers mention singing at work cultures in pre-industrial settings. And some of these bring out quite a lot of the beauty that exists in these pre-industrial singing at work cultures. So I'll just read you two stanzas from words, one of Wordsworth's great poems written at, uh, in the 1790s called The Solitary Reaper. And Try and take yourself away from this industrial setting to the Outer Hebrides, the Western Isles of Scotland, where this encounter between the poet and the solitary reaper occurred. Behold her, single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing by herself, stop here or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds a grain and sings a melancholy strain. Oh, listen, for the veil profound is overflowing with the sound. No nightingale did ever chaunt more welcome notes to weary bands of travellers among some Arabian haunt. A voice so thrilling now was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird, breaking the silence of the seas amongst the farthest Hebrides. So we have a sense of Wordsworth being completely enchanted by the beauty of this singing at work encounter. And this is a very romanticized vision of singing at work. And being a critical management uh, conference, <laughs> there's gonna be a little flip later where we're gonna bring in a critique of that. <laughs> so, we set ourselves the task of looking beyond these literary figures, looking at uh, grounded observations of, where working people's voices were, were recorded, often it was lost to, to history. 
But doing this and amassing a book with 830 footnotes over 10 years, we can now say... I've never been clapped for a footnote before, have I? We can now say with some confidence we can hear the British Isles singing. In, in pre <laughs> Thank you. We can hear, we can hear the, uh, we can hear the, the spinners sing. We can hear the weavers sing, the knitters sing, the sailors sing, the ploughmen sing, the cobblers sing, the tailors sing, the wagoners sing. Some fishermen and fish cutters sing. The harvesters sing. Now this is the cover of our book. I'm afraid we haven't got a bigger picture available. And this is a picture of people going out to to, to the harvest. Led by a piper. Oh, wow. And the piper would stay there during their labour and they would uh, sing along at some points with, with the piper. And, then, and there are some, uh, some descriptions of this actually happening as well as being pictorially represented in this picture from 1720. So we can say that we, heard, that we can hear the British Isles singing. So, what sort of meanings did these, these singing and work cultures have for people? We bring out three main meanings in uh, the, these things have for people. The first meaning was it was a fusion of work and play together, a fusion of fancy and function to, uh, to talk to our keynote, our brilliant keynote from today. It was a, a flight of path, not away from work, but within and through work. So I think this was an amazing cultural form. My, uh, my, uh, my favourite representation of uh, cultural form is this uh, walking song, so it's walking spelled with a U, which was where women in the Western Isles of Scotland gathered together in a form of gift exchange of labour to make cloth uh, water resistant. And they would pound the table, we see them sitting around the table, they would pound the table in unison and use that beat as their drum beat to sing their songs around. So there's no way you can think of it as a form of escapism because part of this work is within the song. So it's an entwining, a meeting of a flight of, of path within and through work, but not, not an escape from it. So I think this makes it, these incredibly rich and, and meaningful cultures. The second form of, uh, form of meaning, unfortunately I would have liked to have played a, a walking song, but our PA fell apart at the last moment. Uh, so, that is, that is a shame. The second sing. Uh, you know what? Uh, I can't sing a walking song because they're all in Gaelic. I know no Gaelic. Make it up. <laughs> I mean, sailors, okay, so sailors, sailors would, would uh, use their sa singing, uh, their shanties, to time and coordinate their labour. So, roll a man down, pull it, roll a man down, sing away, hey! So, uh, within the, the fabric of the song was, was the coordinating rhythms of their labour. So, it was, it was work and play within one. Uh, a cultural form. The second form of meaning that uh, was encapsulated in, in these singing work cultures was one of community. And people sang, in Solitary Reaper was relatively rare, people tend to sing together, collectively. Uh, the most elemental statement of this is a great uh, Cornish Taylor song simply called We Be. Brilliant! You couldn't have a more profoundly clear statement of community. That brilliant! That's a great song as well, it's on the CD. Uh, and the third form of meaning, which is particularly interesting I think for a, for a critical management uh, conference, is these songs allowed voice in the sense of workers airing interests and grievances. And it was the, the fact that it was song itself rather than normal spoken word that allowed, in some cases, allowed an expression of voice that would have been banned, prohibited, in normal discourse. So sailors were not allowed to articulate in normal voice their interests and grievances to the captain and the overseer. 
They could sing in our grievances out, and by God, they did. <laughs> but it was only because it had this mode, this artistic mode. So art here was this, uh, uh, these songs as art was, were things that allowed the unsayable to be said. I think a lot of what we do in this conference is, is exploring how art allows the unsayable to be said. So this, uh, this turns us to the, uh, the flip uh, critique of Wordsworth, beautiful poem, romanticized vision. Now, the nice thing about this poem, to, to do it, offer a critique, is this Hebridean woman that he observed singing would have been also somebody who, who took part in walking. And we know the walking songs, walking cultures, involve these women satirizing male members of the community, and particularly male outsiders. <laughs> so the third, third stanza of Wordsworth poem is brilliant in this light. Will no one tells me what, tell me what she sings? She's singing Gaelic, so he's got no idea. Will no one tells me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old and happy far off things and battles long ago. Or is it some more humble lay, some familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow, loss or pain that has been and may be again? Actually, she's taking the piss out of you, mate. <laughs> So they're the, they're the uh, three main forms of, of meaning, and these cultures meant a lot to people. So I think it should mean something to us to know about them, to understand them, to, to, appreciate, to appreciate them. My last part of the, the talk is just to say what happened to these cultures. Industrialization killed them off in, in nearly all cases. Now the two main expla explanations offered for that is a, a, a basically not strong ones. One, more, one argument is that the machine-driven labour took away the logic of the song-driving labour. But it was only a few cases like, like walking and sailing where the, the, the song was used actually to coordinate. For most singing at work cultures, that function didn't pertain. So the, the lack of labour process functionality taken over by machines is not a strong explanation for the death of these cultures. The other explanation offered is the death of community. Rural communities were ripped apart and, and so song cultures fell apart. But we know enough in our social history to know that community was reformed in industrial settings. This workshop would have been rich with cultures. And we know that uh, uh, many railway occupations have rich singing cultures, but never singing at work cultures. They had rich singing cultures and rich communities, but not singing and work cultures. So, what, were the, what was the proper explanation for the death of these singing cultures? Industrialization in two different ways, to put an end to it. One was the uh, prohibiting by employers of musical expression. So, uh, employers were scared of singing at work. It offered workers power. Imagine. 100 voices joined together in song in this setting. Very, very strong. So employers prohibited because they were scared of the power of voice. They were prohibited because it signified pre-industrial, non-productive habits. So employers banned it. Railway employers, we know the railway employers banned it. One, one uh, railway rule in a Welsh railway company was that not an instance of intoxication, singing, whistling, or hilarity while on duty will be overlooked. And besides being dismissed, the offender will be punished. So this is employers banning musical expression rather strongly. And that's Sylvia Pankhurst's uh, painting, which is a really a painting of silenced work. These people who are silenced. The other explanation for the death of singing and work cultures was the roar of industrial noise, which you can well imagine here. That uh, the roar of, of, of noise overcome people, overcome people's singing voice. Morris Rosenthal, Rosenthal was a tailor who went to work in a factory and wrote a poem called In the Shop. Oh, here in the shop, 
the machines roar so wildly that oft unaware that I am or have been, I seek and I'm lost in the troubled tumult. So we've gone from people singing we be to not even knowing that I am from the roar of industrial noise. Some resistance was possible, and some factories workers were, were able to offer some resistive cultures, and a few scattered factories workers still had some singing work cultures. And one brilliant story that I'll end with comes from a railway workshop. It comes from Alfred Williams' autobiography from the early 1900s, and he's working in a railway workshop. New Year's Eve. We worked until we decided to down tools. Then, he describes, an inventive and musically minded workman stretched a rope across from the principals and came forward with two sets of steel rods of various length and thickness and capable of emitting almost any note in the scale. These were tied about with twine and suspended from a rope in a graduated order from the shortest to the longest. So he's made a musical instrument from industrial items within the workplace. Someone else loaded a big brass dome with a worn out boiler, while others had brought several old buffers from the scrap wagon. Two were trained to strike the rod, and the other was instructed to beat on the dome and the buffers. The workmen commenced their carnival. Bells were perfectly, perfectly struck. The bars of the steel suspended from the rope the buffers contributed their sharp, clear notes, and the bass dome sounded deeply and richly. This was called ringing the changes. <laughs> and on that note, on that carnivalesque, resistive, singing, uh, musical culture expressed within a railway workshop, I'll end the, uh, the talk tonight. And yeah. Eliza Carthy will play a, a few songs that have been unearthed from the, the research project in her set tonight. Yeah. So that'll be nice. So thank you very much. Thank you.